In a jungle clearing that used to be their home, pygmies harvest mangoes from the tree that once gave them both shelter and food. It's no longer home. Donations raised in Australia have paid to move them out of the rainforest. A couple of hundred kilometers south, foreign donations in far larger sums protect mountain gorillas by keeping them in the rainforest. Uganda is home to both pygmies and mountain gorillas. Both are threatened with extinction. Nine hours south of Kampala, a dusty road and civilization end in the mist and mountains of the impenetrable forest. It's home to 300 mountain gorillas, half the world's remaining population. There's no easy way to see the gorillas, and no cheap way either. Nine, ten. You need more than $200 for fees, guides, trackers and porters and a mere head cold automatically disqualifies you from making the trek into the jungle. When they get these infectious diseases, then yeah. they die. OK, so uh, what do we need to know before we go there? Right now, I want to tell you some do's and don'ts. One soon gets the message. Visitors are barely tolerated, and only because both government and conservationists need the revenue. The forest is a national park that survives entirely on tourist income. The search for the gorillas can take eight hours or more. Adults chew their way through 25 kilos of vegetation a day, so each family is constantly on the move, foraging for food. The hunt picks up pace when the trackers find the nest that families make each ah, night. Yeah. They squash down this uh, uh, vegetation. This is called the uh, Mimeliopsis. Yeah. And then they, they are very soft and then they put them on the ground. So they lie on this? Yeah. They, yeah. yeah, every night they have to make uh, a nest. And this is uh, it's, uh, dropping. So, so we got to keep on looking, eh? Yeah. yeah. All right. A long walk. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard going if you're not used to it and there's no guarantee you'll see the gorillas. Only one family of 12 has been acclimatized to human visitors. A second group is gradually being habituated. Long before anyone else can, the trackers spot them sheltering from the rain. It's dark, it's gloomy, it's wet, and it's frustratingly hard to see but that's rainforest for you. Our money buys us exactly one hour to watch in silence from not less than five meters away, while the adult gorillas guardedly watch back. There are, we're told, 12 gorillas in this family, females, babies, and a male silverback who's two meters tall ferociously strong, but somewhat shy. The hour's up, and we haven't actually seen as much as we'd like of an endeavor the world's leading conservationists see as a last-ditch stand against extinction. How important are the gorillas, do you think, from the point of view of Uganda, as opposed to sort of preserving a gorilla population? Do you see them as somehow a symbol of what you're trying to do? Well, I, I think the uh, gorillas, um, uh, in my view, very important for our tourism industry. But, um, but most importantly is for the conservation aspect. Uh, since two-thirds of the remaining population of mountain gorillas now exist in Uganda, uh, unless we conserve them, gorillas will be out of the globe. It's only recently that Uganda has rediscovered such concern for nature. For decades, wildlife was decimated.
wazira nyoka wazira walimu wa wamijana kalimacho kalimacho tulinepa in the 70s, under Idi Amin's notoriously bloody rule, soldiers slaughtered animals for food, for profit, and for target practice. Poaching and civil war continued the carnage into the 80s. A new national park in the far west of Uganda, one of six declared in the past three years. For a century, the rainforest here has been steadily chopped back for its timber, its minerals, and its land. As part of the new image building, Uganda's pygmy tribes have been told they've got to get out because the forest and its wildlife have to be preserved. The impact has been devastating. After thousands of years of living in the jungle, the pygmies are fast becoming fringe dwellers. What we're watching is not just a culture disintegrating, but a race of people hovering like the gorillas on the brink of extinction. Now here we have a group of people that really have been neglected. They have an opportunity to fit into society just like you and me, if they're given the chances. Where Barry Chapman heads the Ugandan branch of ADRA, me, the international uh, relief arm have, like, of the Adventist me, Church. Um, if we're going to have, make some choices about where we should put our money, uh, I think the pygmies really should rate at the top of the list in front of gorillas. ADRA has spent the last 18 months helping to encourage Edward's clan of 60 pygmies to resettle on open lands. Oh, this is your house, is it for me? Yeah. I'm living here. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see a bed. Just by yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Edward still lives in traditional nomadic accommodation, easily built, just as easily left behind. He can do some food to go to cooking here. Yeah. He's been here seven months and still has pitifully few possessions to aid him in his new pastoral life. So these are the new houses, are they, Edward? This is the houses over there. Yeah. Over there, over this there. is the future for Uganda's 6,000 pygmies. Can we, can we look at one? OK. OK. ADRA has built this group a dozen huts with some of the $20,000 it's raised for them in Australia. The main attraction, waterproof roofs. Can I look inside? OK. You enter. And how many people uh, live in here, Edward? There. Mm -hmm. Six people. Six people? Yeah. Yeah? It's very small for six people, yeah. right? But it's, uh, this is more dry than your house? Yeah. Apart from a grant of the land that they now live on, the Ugandan government offers the pygmies no other assistance. Though settled, they're at a loose end. They're happier here. Life is less rigorous than in the jungle but they've moved into a settled life and an economic system that is totally foreign to them. Today, meat is rarely on the menu. Instead, bananas are a staple diet, along with the leaves and herbs they gather from nearby. Sometimes there's fish to be had from a river several kilometers away. But they haven't yet come to grips with fishing. And because they're traditionally nomadic, they have little concept of agriculture. The pygmies wouldn't show us their marijuana plantation, but it's obviously an important part of their life, and so is getting drunk on beer when they can afford it. One can only fear for the pygmies and their culture. 
their only income is from the occasional Muzungu, white tourists who come to Gorp. <laughs> 